halibut, the herring, the salmon. Uh, not only did the salmon not come back last year, I think it was 80% of them didn't come back, but the young salmon that were born when those that did come back went up their streams of origin and were able to produce uh, baby salmon before dying. The baby salmon, when they go out to, to sea, are dying en masse. And these, these imbecile, no, no, they're not imbeciles, they're cowards. These cowardly marine biologists will not say the R word. They say, well, something's causing acidification. Uh, there's a virus. There's, they're lying. They're not telling the truth. No one will say it could be related to the radiation that's being dumped into the ocean around the clock. I salute some of you folks in Alaska who are involved in the fishing industry. Uh, it took the fishermen up there to demand that the fish be tested for radioactivity. Not all the captains, just a few, but some did. And they found out what they suspected was there. Uh, radiation bioaccumulating in the fish. Remember, 80% of the salmon didn't come back last year. We just got word the salmon, the babies, which were coming down out of the mountain streams where they were born into the salt water, were dying. What's killing them, right? Uh, one captain said this is the worst fishing he has ever seen. It's a catastrophe. Crabs, by the way, up there have turned blue. Uh, the herring, the cod, halibut, pollock. He said that the catches are literally dropping off a cliff. There aren't any. They're gone. They're dead. Prove me wrong. They're dead. They didn't migrate down to Chile. They're not hanging out down there, having a good time. They're dead. Uh, this is this is the death of an, the biggest ocean on the planet, the greatest catastrophe. Japan should be held fully accountable. So should General Electric. So should so, Toshiba or anyone else involved with this this uh, this so nightmare. Strong. All American of them. Subcontractors too that. Service Tepco is just a, an umbrella company. Of course, all, all of the all of the companies that actually provided all of the technical and other support were all American companies. Basically, yeah. A lot of the crabs being caught in Alaska, they're all they're all dead. They bring them up and they're dead. So I mean, this is this is not a joke. This situation uh, in Alaska, which was the breadbasket for fish and seafood, you're looking at right now, ladies and gentlemen, the death of seafood. In fact, it's dead. Look at the. Look, I'm sorry to say this. Look at the. Look, I don't eat meat. I don't believe in it. I, I, I don't touch it. Well, what's the name of the chain? Red Lobster. They're toast. They're going to have to start advertising that their fish comes from the Atlantic, or they're going to be out of business. It's just going to happen. Or the deep South Pacific, if they're coming from Argentina. Uh, so what happens is all, all these oceans are connected now. What people should understand is what happens if you let this continue to spin out over, say, the next 5, 10, 20 years. Even if nothing else happens, no war starts, no economic collapse, no thinning of the ozone layer that kills the crops and starts forest fires and destroys the oceans. So we're not even going to add other factors. What the first thing that happens is weakening of the, what we call herd immunity. And it also increases the rate of mutation. So if you have someone in Japan or that's exposed and carry, say, a version of, say, the H5N1 or H1N1 or H7N9, the new Chinese or Asian super flu, uh, that virus is going to be, because the host is under stress and has a free radical load, is going to mutate at an exponentially faster rate. Right. So we don't even need a bioweapon lab. The bioweapon nope. lab are literally the uh, the carriers, the people, and the animals now exposed to these things. So mm -hmm. you could have viruses emerge from the ocean. You can have viruses emerge that have the human receptor binding domain that are people, populations that are now exposed to the radiation. Radiation levels at one of Fukushima's nuclear power stations is at its highest level since the tsunami triggered meltdown nearly six years ago. Tokyo Electric Power, or TEPCO, is reporting that atmospheric readings inside Daiichi's reactor number two are as high as 530 sieverts an hour. To put that in perspective for you, a human that is exposed to a single dose of 10 sieverts would die in a couple of weeks. The levels being recorded here are 53 times that. 
TEPCO says it's possible melted fuel has leaked through the pressure vessel. The discovery is going to seriously challenge the efforts to safely dismantle this plant. Let's bring in Kevin Camp's radioactive waste watchdog from Beyond Nuclear. Kevin, 530 sievers, it seems unfathom unfathomable. <laughs> Can you explain what's likely going on here? Well, you know, um, this catastrophe that's ongoing is uh, nearly six years old at this point, and the fuel, the melted cores, have been missing in action. Uh, Tokyo Electric doesn't know where they are. The Japanese government doesn't know where they are. Nobody knows where they are. So what could have happened is these probes, these cameras, these robots, these radiation monitors that are being sent in by Tokyo Electric to try to figure out what's going on may have encountered the, the closest they've come yet to these melted cores. Mm -hmm. They may even have come upon melted fuel that's not underwater, and water serves as a radiation shielding. So if this is an open air area and there's no water, that could explain. But what you've got are melted reactor cores. And of course, human beings can't be in operating atomic reactors. They also can't be in this area where there's a meltdown. Mm -hmm. And there's also imagery. Uh, it looks like a melt through of a metal grate. And so it all stands to reason that the, the cores melted through the reactor pressure vessels and down into the containment structures, right through that metal grating. And it's not unexpected, but we still don't know where the cores are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's claims that, oh, it's all contained, don't worry about it. There's actually, I mean, it's indisputable that there's a, a daily flow of radioactively contaminated groundwater into the ocean. The figure is something like 80,000 gallons per day of relatively low-level radioactive wastewater. And then you've got those uh, storage tanks. We're talking 800,000 tons of highly radioactive water being stored in tanks because every day they pour 100 tons of water on each of these three melted down cores. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they lose those tanks. They leak, they overflow. So it's an ongoing catastrophe. So you're saying that the contamination in this case could leak out, that that's a possibility? There is some leakage on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And then they try to capture as much as they can and contain it in these storage tanks, which they sometimes lose, whether during a typhoon or through human air, they've had overflows. So, you know, there are many shoes that could still drop at Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, one of the ones is the high-level radioactive waste storage pools that yeah. aren't even inside radiological containment. They don't have all of that spent nuclear fuel transferred to a safer location in a couple of the units still. So if something were to go wrong with that, those would be open-air releases of very high-level radioactivity. We're talking, you know, the acting, the prime minister at the time the catastrophe began, Khan, had a contingency plan to evacuate all of Northeast Japan, up to 50 million people. And it was predominantly because of those storage pools. And we're still in that predicament if one of those pools were to go up in flames, as Tokyo plans to host the 2020 Olympics and bring in many millions of extra people into this already densely populated area. It's not a good idea. So all eyes on them. I want to get back to this specific leak, though. How does this uh, complicate the cleanup efforts there and is it possible even to get something in there right now to examine what's going on I heard that they had a robot that they wanted to put in there a remote controlled robot but it only has a capacity to withhold a thousand sieverts so it would end up dying before it's in there two hours right. for good right state-of-the-art robotic technology mm -hmm. in Japan is a world leader in robotics uh, can only last so long because the electronics get fried by the gamma radiation and probably even neutron radiation that's in there you know, that's the situation deep in there. They're already saying it'll take 40 years to so-called decommission this, but that may be optimistic. And not just that, but in December, the government said it was actually going to take twice as much money, nearly twice as much as they originally thought, to decommission that. Um, does this make matters even worse, this leak, or is this just kind of the situation that we expect at this point? Well, it just shows how dire the situation is. And you know, the figures of $150 billion to decommission, I've seen yeah. figures from a think tank in Japan cited by Greenpeace Japan up to $600 billion. If you do full cost accounting, where is this high level radioactive waste going to go? It's gonna need a deep geologic repository. You have to build that and operate it. That costs 100 billion or more. So when you do full cost accounting, this catastrophe could cost hundreds of billions of dollars to recover from. We're just in the beginning. And not to mention, I mean, if they're talking 40 years, that's a long time to try to figure it out. But leakage happening, possible contamination in our oceans, things that we all need to be paying attention to. It's an unprecedented catastrophe for the world's oceans. And almost six years later, we're still dealing with serious effects of that. Kevin Camps with Beyond Nuclear, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. 
Okay, welcome back. Hour number two. Uh, more fun news. I hope you do keep an eye on that top center column at rents for the latest news on Fukushima. There, there's a lot coming out, but it, it's really of no consequence. I try to pull the stories that they really do matter to us, and uh, they're they're. They're, they're indicators of what TEPCO is and is not doing. And TEPCO is not doing a lot uh, more than it is doing. So we just found out today they dumped 700 million becquerels of tritium into the Pacific. No one was told about that, of course. Uh, more insects in Japan are showing up with obvious mutations from being exposed to radioactivity. Uh, whether they're eating other insects or eating leaves or greenery and becoming genetically mutated that way when they uh, breed and produce offspring, we don't know. 